taking a very familiar psalm and we're going to dissect it in a way that I don't think we've any one of us have ever done before. Because it starts off, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, the first word is important. The first word is the. That is an extremely important word in the beginning of this psalm. Because it's the. It's specific. It's not some. It's not any. It's not this or that. It's the. The. We must understand that. It sounds like, well, that's a silly little word. We all know it. But it really is important because if we don't have the there, then we can have a whole host. And it's very specific that we make sure we don't have a whole host, that we have just the. Okay, now we spent five minutes on the first word. How long do you think it's going to take to get through this whole psalm? <laughs> now, the next word, Lord. Okay, now, it's specific because of the. Lord, now we have to determine specifically which Lord. Because... So it's the Lord, but who is the Lord? That's how we, we, we see we, we can't just automatically assume things. We have to specifically say it because the is there. The Lord, in this instance, as the psalm goes on, clearly tells us it is the Almighty God. Now, the Almighty God that tends to lead us to something to understand that we have to know that this Almighty God, what Almighty is, there is no limitations. There are so many things that we can look around and see that demonstrate how Almighty our God is. One of the things that struck me this week was when I was looking out at something I have seen many, many times before, but where we had carved out part of the side of our hill when we built the house, the trees that are up on the upper bank there are leaning out. Now, why are they leaning out? They're leaning out to capture the sunlight. Now, who told the trees to lean out? How do they know this? Does the tree have a brain? Does it think? Does it comprehend? But how do, what we, does it really know? Or does it just do? Because of the Lord. It just does because of the Lord. Not because it knows. Not because it has built in DNA that is going to tell it to do this or that. No, it's because the Lord created the tree and sustains the tree. So the tree does what the Lord commands. The tree is obedient. And it also has no brain. There are many Christians that are disobedient, and sometimes I wonder if they have a brain. Um, but, so we kind of gather the fact that we're talking about the Lord, the God Almighty, the sustainer, the one who is, who was, and is to come. This makes sure we understand this because if we don't know who we're talking about as we delve deeper into this psalm, then all the other things have only surface meaning. Is is the next word. Not was, not going to be. Not might be, but is. Another important word. So, the Pacific Lord Almighty is. Now, present tense. Not future, not elsewhere, now. And it's a continuous now. Because when the psalm was written by King David, it was is then. And in the future, it still we will be, is, now. Again, an important word. Only two little letters, but it helps us to understand the depth of this psalm. Next word, my. Very, again, very important word, because now this 
almighty God who is now is mine. This God that actually told the tree to lean out towards the sunlight and does all these miraculous things every day is mine. Mine, personally. Not, it's ours, but it specifically is mine. Because only I can know the relationship I have with my God. Nobody else can know it. We may look around the room and we may think that this person has a good relationship with God and this person does and this person does, but we can't know it like we can know it with ourselves. So we can only judge inwardly as far as what is that relationship. And then we can declare, mine. It's mine. So the Lord is my, and then the shepherd. The shepherd, again, is something that we sort of grasp, but sort of don't. Uh, we sort of grasp because it's used so often in our church circles and what I call church speak, church talk, the way that we talk. We, we don't get into understanding shepherd. We just know what it is. It's kind of like we've learned this by osmosis. It's sort of, it's ingrained in us so we really understand it. No, we don't. Let's face it. There's so many things that we think we know we don't know. Because a shepherd is more than just someone who is caring for the sheep. Now, we, we know that, and, and it's, a, it's right, it's true. Um, and we are the sheep, and we, we know that, and you know, it's like God is our shepherd, and, and he cares for us, and, and it's all well and good, and it's all correct. But it's more than that. A shepherd is also a guide, but not just any guide. See, when you go out on an expedition someplace that you've never been to, and it's kind of a way out place, it's nice to have a guide. Somebody to guide you to, from place to place, to warn you about the dangers, to, to show you the glories. Um, having a guide, very helpful. But this shepherd is more than just our guide. He's a guide in a direct, in particular direction. Not just the guide anywhere. He's our guide particularly in a particular direction that he calls us to go. We don't know how to get there. We have a tendency to constantly want to wander off. But we have a shepherd that guides us in a particular direction. He says, this is the path. Stay on this path and you will arrive at your destination. And I will help you. Matter of fact, not only am I going to help you, I am going to guarantee that you're not going to wander too far off the path. That's a pretty good guide. And this one is the Almighty God who is mine is the one that's guiding me, the one that's protecting me, the one that's leading me. And now we go back to the next word, I. Again, it brings it personal. This whole thing is personal. It's me, it's I, shall. Shall what? Shall not want. But how can I shall, how can I not want? Because I have so many wants. But if I am following the Almighty God, my shepherd, who is directing me down this path to take care of me, to sustain me, what else do I need? Because I will need nothing else because I, so I can't want anything else. Because I now have everything that is any good guaranteed. So I shall not want, because what would I want? It's kind of like you have in your pocket a $100 bill and laying on the ground 
is a penny. Do you want that penny? Yeah, kind of. No, I really don't. It's time for Ben now to get it. I don't need it. I don't want it. Unless you're Bill. Then he'll pick up the money. But anyway. No. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we don't. Why would we want an insignificant thing when we have so much? Yes, they are. Uh huh. Because we lack nothing. Verses 2 and 3 give us a little bit more insight. And we're going to look at a few things in that. See, it starts off with he, and he is the Lord. This Lord that we have already looked at who he is. So he makes me, he leads me, he restores me. In verse 2 and 3, we see that. He makes me, but he it almost sounds like, and now all of a sudden this whole personal thing has changed over to he makes me he forces me no that's misunderstanding of what is being said he makes me want to there's the big difference between being forced to and want to but because he is my personal lord he is my personal shepherd I want to because he's leading me he leads me and I want to follow and then he restores me now that is a big deal it really is a big deal because he restores me from what well I had if I was to be restored I had to be something else beforehand I was lost. I was lost in my sin. And he restores me back to that sinless person in the sight of my Lord, my God. Jesus restored me. So I've been restored. And this is what I want to do. Continuing in verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, he makes me want to lie down in green pastures. Now, understanding green pastures is pretty well green pastures, brown pastures, where do the cows go? Okay, where do the sheep go? Well, we want the green pastures. And we're not talking about green dollar bills. We're talking about everything that we need to sustain us see in Jose he's leading us into being sustained and, and our mind automatically goes to well he provides me with housing with clothing with food and with drink um, he does but that's not our greatest need our greatest need is him so we have this whole concept of he's providing me He's making me want to depend upon him because he's providing. Because the bread of life, in order to receive it, we need to stop. Because a pasture is not a place for hurrying through. A pasture is for grazing, staying, enjoying, being sustained. And especially in a green pasture that has abundance. And next he leads me beside quiet waters. Not rushing waters. Not stagnant waters. The two extremes. Quiet. You know, kind of like you see this brook kind of slowly on it's moving along. And it's, you know, just clear and clean and and you can actually drink from it it's it's just so nice and peaceful and calm a peace that peace of god that surpasses all understanding that even in the midst of other things going on in our lives we have this peace because the lord who is my shepherd provides it Verse 3, 
I skip when I know that. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restores my soul. Once I was lost, now I'm unfound. Because he loves me. He loves me so much that while even while I am lost, he went forth through the effort to find me and to provide for me a way to be restored. This is from the Lord God Almighty who is mine. But why? Why did he do this? We say, well, because he loves us. He loves us and he wants to do this. That's the why. No, it's not. It's true he loves us. It's true he wants to do that. It's true he wants to save us. The why is for his name's sake. See, it always comes back to bringing glory to God, not bringing glory to me. Not that I am accomplishing something. Not that through me, it brings me glory. No, it always goes back to his namesake. Nothing else. So it's, it's for his glory, for his namesake. And then we go to that dark side of the psalm. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even though, even though, not because of, this is going to be part of our life. Not we're going to be exempt from it, because it's going to be there. It's even though. It's part of who we are. It's part of what we live in. It's part of this fallen sinful world that we are bound to for this time. But because the Lord God Almighty is my shepherd and I shall not want, it's an even though it was a problem, he's still my shepherd. I walk through. See, we follow where he leads us. But we're walking. He's not carrying us. It's not saying, okay, you just get down in your lazy boy and relax because I'm going to take you to your destination. No. He says, no, you're going to walk. You're going to walk because if you don't walk, you can't learn. And if you don't learn, you can't understand. And if you don't understand, you can't bring me glory. Because you can only bring me glory because you want to. So walking is part of your training. Part of your learning. Part of what you need to do in order to bring glory to God. And because he is my shepherd, I want to bring glory to him. So I'll walk. Then the valley. Valley automatically brings upon itself this concept of lowness in life of the really dark, deep times, the things that we're, the troubles and str struggles that we go through, and the things that, you might say, we would just as soon avoid. And that's true. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about these tough times in life. Because it's, remember, it's even though. But we are walking. But even though we are walking, we are walking into this world that is so steep in sin. 
but he's still my shepherd. He is still leading me. He is still guiding me. He is still protecting me. That's why the even though. The valley, that low place of the shadow of death. Now, there's two almost conflicting words here. Shadow, which is one of those things that um, we think of kind of scary. And then there's death, which we kind of think of those things that we want to avoid. But how many people do you know that have ever been harmed by a shadow? <laughs> okay, but the shadow itself has never harmed anyone. Shadows don't. Shadows are very unique in the simple fact that they actually have no substance, no mass. It is a nothing that we can see. Interesting. What else is nothing that you can see? I can't think of anything else. So shadow being unique. So, so you're using the term shadow here for a specific reason. As like every single word in the Bible, especially when we looked at the. It was the was there for a reason. Shadow is there for a reason. Because it has no substance. The shadow of death, death for us has no substance. Because death has been defeated. Because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, death has no sting. Death for us is not an end, but a beginning. So it has something to the shadow of no substance, and then death, even though I'm down in this valley, what harm can come? Because the Lord is my shepherd. He is guiding me. He is protecting me. I have no reason to be afraid of the shadow. And I have no reason to be afraid of the death. I fear no evil. Why? Why don't we fear evil? We try to avoid evil. We try to stay away from evil. But we should not fear evil. Because it goes back to the beginning again. Because the Lord is my shepherd. What else can come against me when the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the sustainer of everything, is protecting me. I have no reason to fear if he is my shepherd. And then your rod, the one we don't like, and the staff, the one we do like, they comfort me. Now, I don't know about you all, but I guarantee you, I have had many a times that the rod has comforted me. The rod of correction. That afterwards was very comforting because it prevented me from doing something or saying something or acting a certain way. Because the rod of correction sometimes is a small rod and sometimes it's a two by four upside the head. Um, but the correcting part is there. And knowing that I am being beat upon by a loving God who is doing it for no other reason than his love for me because he wants what's best for me. I am comforted that he cares so much that he will correct me. And then the staff. The staff is actually used to protect to pull back from danger, to hold, to provide. So not only is the rod correcting me, but the staff is guiding me. So this Lord God Almighty, the Lord who is my shepherd, is the one that is providing this safety so that I don't have to fear evil and they comfort me. It gives me great comfort knowing that God is in control. 
it gives me great comfort knowing that he is the one that I can depend upon. And it gives me great comfort knowing that he will never fail me. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. You prepare. Here again. You, the Lord, God Almighty, is the one who prepares. He prepares a table before me. Now, what is, goes on a table, but what is needed to be sustained? So no matter what enemies try to take away of what I need, they can't. Because the Lord has prepared the table. Nothing will stop our God from caring for us. You've anointed to be anointed because of your anointing me. You're choosing me. See, when somebody was anointed with oil, it was they were singled out for a particular purpose. That's what anointing was. Each and every one of us have been singled out because the Lord is my shepherd. So we have been individually singled out to be shepherded by the great shepherd. It which changed my mind and it changed my heart. And my cup overflows. The blessings that come from our God is like pouring into a cup and you have a cup and you have an ocean and the ocean is pouring into the cup only thing is as the cup overflows the overflow goes back into the ocean there is no end there is no limit so picture that. Picture that cup being filled from the ocean, which in and of itself would be, well, there's no end. Well, yeah, there would be. Actually, it would be an end. But if it all flowing back, because our blessings come to us and they flow back to the provider because it brings glory to God. So our cup overflowing is again bringing God the glory. Verse 6a, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. Okay, surely. Now, we know surely, but that's not the surely we're talking about. Okay, this is a different surely. It's not Aunt Shirley. It is established surely. It's established. Goodness and loving kindness they're established because the Lord is my shepherd they're established that goodness and loving kindness goodness everything that is good for me being given by a God who has an unending love because my cup is overflowing and it is constantly coming back and there is no end to it that loving kindness not just kindness but loving kindness a kindness that is beyond just nice it is loving he loves us will again will follow me all the days of my life will and again this is not uncle will this is guaranteed will follow okay all these blessings that are coming from this overflowing cup are coming they're, they're following me they just keep coming the blessings don't end because they're just following me and that's will it's guaranteed not maybe, but will. And then again, me. Again, it brings it back to a personal me. And then all. 
all doesn't leave a whole lot of room for anything else. Yeah. At least in context. So, will the blessings follow me? It's not a question. Yes, it's a guarantee. They will follow me. How long? All the days of my life. Now, how long is your life? Well, even if you're not, it's forever. Right. So that's a long time. We can at least grasp that part. See, we can't really totally understand it because it's kind of beyond our grasp, but we sort of can. So the all is not being established just for our period of life here on earth, but it continues because it's all. It's not from the time you are born until the time you are die, all these wonderful things are going to be happening. No, from the time you are born, oh, continues. My life, because my life doesn't end with death, because I do not fear death. I have no fear of death because he is with me. Verse 6b, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, we have all these blessings, and then we have and. So we have all and and. How can you have all and and? Because all was specific to all these blessings, and then there's the and. The and is, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I will dwell, this is where I'm going to stay. This is where I'm going to always be. And the house of the Lord, in order to be in somebody's house, which we, when we picture that, we're not in somebody's house generally, at least we're not, probably most times not supposed to be, unless they're there. Now on rare occasions there might be a house there or whatever, but generally that, that concept of, I'm going to go to somebody's house, I'm going to go there because the owner of the house is there. So I'm going to be with the owner of the house. And here it is, the house of God. And I'm going to go and be in the house of God forever because he is there. So there's the and to the all. Forever. Without end. In the house. Without end. One more, and this is, the next slide will make no sense until you explain it. The dog in his house. Now, where in the world did that come out of Psalm 23? Well, it doesn't, but it does. And this struck me the other day, you might say, as I am at home, sitting in the back room, and uh, kind of looking around, and realizing that this back room is the dog house. This is the dog's house. This is where the dog lives. Okay. Um, and I know, I know. <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, as I'm going through this psalm and I'm looking at all these wonderful things that God has given us and demonstrated to us and shown us that how we are guided and protected and watched over and cared for and that the God, Lord God Almighty is the one that's doing it. I'm thinking about this dog in his doghouse. Okay, it's a decent sized room. But inside this room, there are some features that you normally wouldn't see in a doghouse. I mean, while there is the food and the water and there is a dog bed, there's also a table and chairs there's also a hot tub. Um, there is also an entertainment center. Um, there is also a refrigerator with, uh, you might say, cold drinks. Um, there is also a heat and air unit for that room alone. 
So this dog has it really, really good, but doesn't realize it. Because I have never once seen the dog turn on the air conditioner. I have never once seen the dog open up the hot tub and climb in. I have never once seen the dog sit in the chair at the table. I have never once even seen the dog climb on top of the entertainment center to get its treats. Now we can do the same thing when we fail to understand that the Lord God Almighty is the one that sustains us. We have all these benefits, but we don't take advantage of them. So we're like the dog in the doghouse. It's there. It's open. It's available. But day after day, month after month, year after year, it's ignored.